Welcome to American Black Journal. I'm Stephen Henderson. After nearly two years of surveying and mapping, the Detroit Works Project Long-Term Planning unveiled an incredibly ambitious plan to redevelop the city in new ways. Business leaders, citizens, community groups, and philanthropists all contributed ideas and funding to this long-term plan. So joining me today are two people who have been a, a key part of the Detroit Works since the beginning. Alice Thompson, who's the CEO of Black Family Development and a member of the Detroit Works Steering Committee, and Dan Kincaid from Hamilton Anderson and the Detroit Works long-term technical team. Welcome to American Black Journal. Thank you. So this was a very big week, I think, in Detroit. Uh, I've never seen anything quite like this plan, which is uh, humongous and, and incredibly uh, detailed. It's not, I have to say, it's not what I expected. I thought that, uh, I thought the plan wouldn't have this kind of uh, incredible detail and, and it really is a blueprint for for the future of the city. Talk about uh, where we go from here though, like we, we've got this now, what does this now mean for, for people who live here? Sure, absolutely. I mean, ideally what, we, what we've made is not necessarily a master plan, the conventional document that folks are used to. We've really created a framework and, and it's a framework for decision making. It happens to be incredibly comprehensive in nature as you've, as you've noted. Yeah. It, it covers things like economic growth, land use, our neighborhoods, city systems, how we use our public land and, and building assets. And it actually brings them all back together and integrates them in a way that can then facilitate uh, better, more strategic decision making in the long run because we realize we're at a point where uh, for, for a very long time folks within the city have, have, have done for themselves what others maybe could not do, right? right. But, but we don't really have the opportunity to, to, to perhaps not use resources as well as we could. This is about using those resources as best as we can, being as strategic as possible to make sure we can move the entire city forward. Right, right. And Alice, uh, at Black Family uh, Development, you were a member of the, of the, the Detroit Works uh, team. It seems to me that one of the, the, the genius parts of this plan is that it did include groups like yours, uh, neighborhood groups, and, and ordinary citizens in the way uh, that, it was, uh, that it was put together. Absolutely. And I'm going to say of my experience being involved in lots of initiative going back to the 70s and calling this the, the Renaissance City, I have not <laughs> seen anything that has been as broad, deep, and comprehensive that really focused on civic and community engagement. Uh, there was a real push from day one that this is not going to work unless we have the engagement of every citizen who is interested in this city. Right. And that was a continuous push. And we kept moving until we got it right. And so the number of residents who came out to small meetings and large meetings and gave their voice and input was simply phenomenal. Right, right. And, and so w what's your sense of what their reaction would be to this plan? I mean, that's always the, the, the fear in Detroit is that you come out with a plan like this and the first instinct for a lot of people is to say, this is something that outsiders are trying to do to us, not something that we're supposed to do for ourselves. But I think Detroiters are going to see their footprint in this plan, this framework, because they helped design it. And when you read it, the, the language is so respectful of the input of the average ordinary person. Right. And so for those who came to the table, they were serious about being heard and they were heard. Right. And so as you read the plan, you're going to see Detroiters in this plan. You're going to see a mixture of our planning experts working with local residents about what we wanted to see in this city. You cannot do a plan that's successful without Detroit is blessing it. And so <laughs> their input is going to be seen, I believe, in these pages. Right. Uh, Dan, in terms of implementation uh, of this, we've got Kresge saying, here's $150 million uh, at least to get started, but I imagine that's sort of a drop in the bucket, really, when you think about all of the, the ideas that are in here. Uh, what do we need uh, to make this this more than just a plan and something that, that Detroiters sort of live with? Yeah, right. Well, I think we need a few things. Uh, the first is to realize that, that now is the time for action, right? Now is the time to move forward with some serious steps. It is a long-term uh, planning effort, right? So it looks out over a series of time horizons, the ability to stabilize the city tomorrow, to improve it substantially over perhaps the next 20 years, and then really transform it over the long long haul, but with, with good uh, resources in place like those that, that Kresge's offered up. And really it's a, it's, it's a demonstration of their commitment to this project and the fact that, that those resources are going to be deployed through, through the framework itself, right? right? 
to make sure that they're so strategically in, in, uh, used, uh, I think it's, e it's even better. And so what folks can, you know, investors, business leaders, neighborhood groups, everybody can have confidence that those resources are going to be in place right. and they can actually build on that. And it starts, it starts in small ways with, with small scale pilot projects. It starts in, in maybe larger ways with, with things that are already starting within the city, within the Detroit Water and Sewage Department and SEMCOG. There's already a green infrastructure project that's, that's going to sure. be coming out that that's line, aligns directly with what we're trying to accomplish here. Uh, you know, Alice, uh, I, I think when I think about the city and I think about neighborhoods, uh, I think I tend to think about the neighborhoods that we don't talk about. Uh, uh, when we talk about neighborhoods in the city, we tend to talk about the neighborhoods that are stable, places like Palmer Woods and Indian Village, or places that are really, really distressed, where you have one or two houses on a block. But it seems to me that most of the city is somewhere in between those two, and and citizens there are really feeling uh, the decline. I mean, that's the, that's where the critical sort of uh, decline is is taking place. Um, what's your sense of what this plan means to those people? Well, those individuals were involved in the process. Uh -huh. We specifically reached out to those particular neighborhoods, and what we found was, was phenomenal hope and optimism about their city, and tremendous love for their neighborhood in spite of the decline. And so, what you have is small groups like block clubs mm -hmm. in some neighborhoods. Uh, neighborhood associations who came to the table and they have plans on the table for their particular community right now. What this will do for them is help them bring that to scale. We can really begin to take our investments and be very strategic about helping those neighborhoods. But neighborhood residents, and I'm going to say block club leaders, were very much engaged in the process. And so again, this plan does not start from new. We're building about what people are already trying to do and okay. can bring it to scale. Right. So, so the residents see really hope for their neighborhoods. And I'll give a really small story about my block. Sure. Wh Since where do you live? In uh, North, uh, West Detroit. Okay. Okay. And on my block two years ago, I looked around and there were five vacant houses, either through foreclosure or some other kind of uh, reason. Just on your block? On my block alone, okay. right. And it was a wonderful, beautiful, robust Northwest block, right. But do you know over this period of time, I have seen people come back into those homes. The last home that was still vacant, I saw a porch light go on Monday night. And right? I was so happy, right? And, and so there, there is people who are saying, this city is worth staying in, uh, is worth investing in. And so there is an air of hope and optimism, however small it may be right now, but it's important for this work going forward. Right. Um, one of the most knowledgeable reporters on the Detroit Works Project and how the city of Detroit could be reimagined is my colleague from the Free Press and the author of Reimagining Detroit, John Gallagher. He joins us now from his home in Detroit. Welcome, John, to ABJ. Thanks, Stephen. How are you doing? Uh, good. Um, you know, John, I know that uh, you have spent more time than almost anyone I know uh, thinking and, and writing about what is going on in the city now and what should be going on to, to sort of uh, make things better. I'm, I'm really curious, now that you've seen this Detroit Works uh, report, how similar uh, is what's in this report to what you found in your research? Well, I think this is the uh, uh, compilation of all the latest um, sort of cutting edge thinking and strategies about what to do with post-industrial cities. So I think this, this is, as you said, Stephen, is the most um, comprehensive uh, and innovative collection of ideas uh, that we have for an American city. This goes, for example, far beyond what Youngstown, Ohio did in their Youngstown 2010 plan. And I think the, the notions about uh, concentrating resources in the key areas to, to densify, I think that's really important. I think some of the blue and green infrastructure things that they want to do with landscape is very important. So I think this report is really um, right on and where we need to go. I think it, the question, of course, is, is what happens from this point on. Right. Uh, John, you have lived here a long time and, and seen plans come and go. Uh, you know, w when they built the, the Renaissance Center in the 70s, I remember I was a kid then. Uh, that was supposed to be the turnaround point uh, for Detroit. Is this different? And if so, why do you think it is? Well, it's quite different. The Renaissance Center was one of those big showcase projects, a castle on the riverfront that had zero chance of turning around <laughs> Detroit's problems. And um, we're getting more realistic. We understand that, that 60 years of suburban sprawl is not going to reverse itself. The, the, the population and the tax base has mostly moved to the suburbs, and that's not going to reverse. So what we're saying is, what can we make of our city now? What can we do with a street like West McNichols 
uh, where there's some hospitals and some good employment district how, districts. How do we beef that up with uh, with enhanced uh, transit options, for example? How do we get Detroit residents to the jobs that exist? Uh, what does our transit system have to look like? What does a landscape have to look like if there's zero chance of ever getting the homes and the shops back into some of these neighborhoods? So I think the plan is much more realistic and probably uh, gives you a framework of where we ought to be going. Uh, I know, John, that you've looked at lots of other cities uh, in terms of how they've managed this kind of decline. And of course, in Detroit, it's always been more acute than than in most other other places. Are, are there things that you're seeing in this plan that remind you of things that people have tried other places, and and have they been successful in those places? Yeah. Well, the big uh, the big um, idea is concentration of resources. Um, so that if you go to Pittsburgh um, or some of those cities, Philadelphia, uh, you see neighborhoods that have really become successful because all kinds of uh, people and organizations have poured resources into the into the area. You have to get to a certain tipping point. Uh, it's been noticed that if you build scattered site uh, housing uh, in a distressed neighborhood, say 10 new homes or 20 new homes, it really doesn't do much good. You really have to pour in a lot of resources and you have to start with a place that's got some uh, some vitality to begin with. So as you said, it's those neighborhoods in the middle. Uh, it's not the most distressed neighborhoods, but it's the neighborhoods in the middle or that are doing you know, relatively well uh, that need greater concentration of resources. And I think that's something that you're seeing in a lot of other cities that have turned around certain neighborhoods. If you were in charge of implementing this, John, uh, what would be your first, your first big, big move? What, what would be the way that you would uh, get uh, people in Detroit to buy into it, number one, but, but number two, to see that, that it's actually going to make a difference uh, in their neighborhoods? Well, the obstacle here is not the money, because we do come up with money to do stuff we want to do. We built casinos and the Riverwalk and all that stuff. And it's not the politi uh, politicians, because they'll line up behind a, a successful plan. I think it's the bureaucra bureaucratic uh, inertia. Um, uh, you know, this plan requires us to rewrite the Detroit zoning code in significant ways. Right. It requires us to have agencies as diverse as water and sewer and Detroit public schools working together. And that's very hard to do. Uh, the City Planning Commission just uh, adopted a new urban agriculture ordinance. It took them four years to do it. And it mostly uh, recognizes the existence of community gardens that are already operating in the city. So that's a fairly minor thing that took four years. So I think rewriting the total zoning code to, to encompass all these innovative ideas is, is a big challenge. And I think it's that that sort of thing is going to be the problem, getting sort of the bureau, you know, moving the bureaucracy. Moving the moving city government to make it to make it actually work. Uh, right. uh, one, one last question for you, uh, John. I, I'm really curious about the idea of moving people. We've been talking about that for a couple of uh, years in Detroit, uh, ever since Detroit work started. This plan doesn't really say that people will have to move, but if, I think if you read through it, it it's pretty clear that, that uh, there will be some deprioritization of certain areas and people will be encouraged to move. How, how realistic is that uh, in a city like Detroit? Uh, not very. Um, relocating residents um, voluntarily through incentives has not really worked very well uh, anywhere. They tried it uh, in a minor degree in Youngstown, Ohio, and uh, almost nobody uh, bit. So I think we're not going to be moving people out. We have to uh, understand that we can sort of work around um, some of the remaining um, occupants, um, residents, buildings, commercial activity in some of the most distressed neighborhoods. That's the only way you got to work that to, to understand it's going to be a very complex urban landscape with some residences, some some old time businesses, and then a lot of new stuff happening around them. I think the, that's the only way that we're going to do this to accept it. it's going to be a very complex environment. So, so then what happens, though, to people who are still in those areas uh, that, that, are, that are mostly depopulated? I mean, we have that happening now. You know, the Near East Side uh, of the city, I think, is a great example, where you really only have a couple houses per block. You anticipate that that, that will continue, but that, that what's around them will change? Yeah, I think so. You know, I think, well, if the plan is carried out, then you'll see some of the vacant lots become um, uh, orchards, farms, um, blue infrastructure, you know, uh, retention ponds for rainwater. And that will happen in and around um, some of these neighborhoods. Now, I think they'll probably, um, to make it go down easier, they'll probably pick the most abandoned areas to start where there, there's going to be less pushback. Uh, any place you're going to have a lot of pushback uh, because there's still a lot of residents there, you're not going to see that much happening. 
Uh, we may clean up some vacant lots, but for example, if, if there's a street with half the homes left, I don't think you'll see, say, a farm on the other half. I think you'll see the farms and the orchards and that sort of stuff on the blocks where there's maybe one home left per block. Okay. Thank you very much for joining us, John. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, I want to turn back to, to you guys and talk some more specifically about some of the things that, that jumped out at me in the, in, the, in the plan. I think it's full of this sort of wonderful, like I said, detail. And, and there's a phrase that I wanted to, to, to start us off with that uh, is in, in, I think, the, the first uh, section that talks about the economy. It says, Detroit is not too big, its economy is too small. I thought that was such a wonderful way to talk about it, not just, uh, and I think that's true not just in terms of business, that's, in, that's true in terms of residents, that's yeah. true, I mean, it's, it's a really global statement about how, what our, what our problem is. Yeah, absolutely, and, and, and uh, there are real issues on the ground in Detroit, you know, and, and <clears throat> there are things that we need, that we absolutely need to deal with, and th that's what this is working toward, but, but fundamentally it's about really transforming that perception, too. Yes, we've got a lot of land. We've got a lot of available vacant land. And oftentimes that, vac that vacant land is really categorized as a tremendous liability. Right. What we're trying to do here is say, actually, that can be an incredible asset. You have Detroit. to turn it into an asset, but it can be. Right? Absolutely. So, so in this case, Detroit has the opportunity to, to move from being considered, in many cases, from an urban perspective, a kind of retrograde model, into being a new model, an innovative model that can lead other cities. This is our chance to lead others, to show how you can use your land uh, to develop greater employment. You can actually use it to institute green and blue infrastructure systems that actually help us uh, clean our air and clean our water and do a whole host of things that, that other folks can't do. It can also help us develop more innovative urban models of neighborhoods. Right, so right. And, and uh, that, that phrase kicks off a chapter that talks about these different employment uh, districts yes. uh, in the city. Talk some about how that how that's supposed to work and what what that really means. Sure. Well, what we've done is we, we've taken a, a very evidence based but also place based approach to the economic growth here. Oftentimes, when economic growth is talked about at, at a number of different levels, it tends to float above. We really know that we need to land it on the ground, and it's something we actually heard time and again from from residents from and during the during at, the community meetings. Yeah. Absolutely. And so so we took that to heart. Uh, and we recognize that, look, most times the employment uh, conversation within the city of Detroit begins and ends with greater downtown in a lot of ways, right? Uh, but that we, we know that that is very important. We need to build on what's there, but we need to actually expand beyond it. And so what we've done is we've included overall seven employment districts. These are areas that we think can be strategically uh, coordinated for, for, for greater resources, greater deployment of, of investment, uh, but also uh, uh, more guidelines for, for regu regulatory reform that can help things in these areas. Help grow jobs. Absolutely, and it begins to, to actually build on the employment opportunities that are already there, which demonstrates a diverse array of different industries, from digital and creative downtown to eds and meds in midtown, uh, to potentially an Eds and Meds emerging corridor along McNichols. That John, West McNichols. As John uh, had noted, you, sure. you know, you've got University of Detroit Mercy, you've got Mary Grove, you've got Sinai Grace, you've got WC3. The bones are there. Let's build on it. And then lastly, the fact that, you know, Detroit has been an industrial city, it is an industrial city, and it will be an industrial city. And those industrial jobs demonstrate the, the skilled labor that we have with, within the city and, and provide an opportunity for, for employment for a wider array of Detroiters. Because today, at the, for the folks within the city of Detroit who are employed, who are part of the active labor force, and by the way, the majority of folks, 25 to 64 within the city of Detroit, are not part of the active labor force. Are not part force. of the labor force, sure. For those few people within the city who are working, the majority of them work outside the city, as Alice had mentioned earlier, and, and, and in a city where you really don't have a good public transportation system, or at least one that struggles to serve sure. such diminished uh, density, uh, you really have uh, limited means to get out to those jobs, especially when a fifth of the population doesn't have a private vehicle. So we need to bring the jobs back into Detroit. We need to center them in these districts. We need to concentrate resources there too. Yeah, Alice, uh, jobs for Detroiters, that's got to, I mean, that's just got to be music to your ears and, and uh, all the people uh, in your organization. And, and it has been to many of the residents too, but there there is a growing, really expanding entrepreneur sector in this city. Sure. Yeah. And so you have in neighborhoods where neighborhood residents are learning how to be their own entrepreneurs and create money within their own neighborhoods flowing by helping each other. That's increasing in our city. Right. And that's a really important piece. And, and I do want to say this about, about the quote about our size. Mm -hmm. We've looked around the country at various cities. And so for our land size and our land mass and our population, it's like Atlanta. 
Atlanta's flourishing, right? Sure. Yeah. But how we think about our city and how we perceive is very important. That language is helping to reshape our thinking about our city. Right. Declining population is not a doom uh, for a city. Uh, right, it's right. how you then begin to use the land that you have based upon that population. So the notion about aligning our assets you know, with opportunity and innovation are key things for us right now. This city's size is fine. We need a bigger, robust economy. you got to make better use of exactly. it. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. And Atlanta's a great uh, example. I mean, uh, Atlanta's a very large city mm -hmm. uh, and not not very dense in terms of, uh, you know, in terms of its uh, population. Yes. But it's the population that it has. It's retained far more of its middle class yes. uh, than, yes. than Detroit has. And, in fact, uh, there are wealthy, very wealthy neighborhoods inside the city of Atlanta that help uh, uh, shore up that tax base and then you've got a lot of working class neighborhoods where people have jobs. Yeah. And, and, and I would add one thing to that too that if you look at cities like Atlanta or Denver or Portland uh, these are places that can be considered peer cities in many ways to, to Detroit and, and often in the, the dialogue in Detroit we talk about those areas of high vacancy or low low density right. right but in fact we think the in some cases the more important end of the equation are the higher density areas and quite honestly when Detroit compares with those other places we have a, a, a much smaller uh, percentage of our total land area that is actually high density even right. though we have greater population mm -hmm. that's one of the critical problems for Detroit we have to actually build on those areas of higher density and it begins to actually buoy the entire city right uh, when, when you say that though a lot of people here uh, you're going to pay attention to wealthier neighborhoods uh, at the expense of the, the, the more struggling uh, yeah. areas. Uh, how do you that's not, that's just, that perception? That's not the case. It, it is not the case. It, it, this, if, if anything is true about this, about this project, it's that, it's that fundamentally this is about the city as a whole right o overall this is this is uh, this is uh, uh, an effort to, to bring the entire city forward and a higher density does not mean higher income right right, right. there are a lot of high density areas that, that, that aren't that aren't uh, and, and this it fundamentally is an equitable strategy it has to be an equitable strategy to move to move the city forward right uh, when I think of high density and not necessarily wealthy the first place that comes to my mind is is Southwest uh, I mean that's an area that that is probably the most dense in 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 Detroit, uh, it's not. I mean, there are there are some middle class areas of it, but it's not what you would think of when you think of Palmer Woods or Indian Village. Uh, I would imagine that's a place that's going to get a lot of attention uh, under this plan. There are many places that will get attention, but I'm going to say this: those challenge areas have had the most robust involvement in this process. Is that right? They're the ones who've come to the table. They're the ones who are solely invested in this, and so. In terms of how we begin, we're going to spread throughout the city, not just look at one area. And so there's a number of areas that we're going to look at at the same time, and these are areas that have things going on right now. We're going to build up on that. Uh, but, but not just one area. But I have to lift up that people who live in those most challenged communities have come to the table most frequently uh, to be they're, involved they're in the, the ones, process. Yeah, right. Well, they have the most at stake mm -hmm. in, in, Absolutely. in a lot of ways. Yes. I, 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 when I, we have about two minutes left. I want to talk about the, the, the leveraging of public assets. Uh, uh, we fight a lot in Detroit about uh, those assets, things like the water department, uh, our, our parks. Uh, a lot of people think that maybe we aren't in a position to be able to to maintain those uh, just as solely public assets, but but in the report, I think you guys really took a look at what could be done with uh, to leverage those for for economic growth, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, uh, if you look at the water system overall, I mean, it, it's an incredible incredible system, right? right. Uh, uh, one of the largest in the world overall, but unfortunately, it's only operating about fifty per, fifth, or excuse me, forty percent of its overall of its capacity. capacity. Sure. So, and, and without the revenues to come in to actually support it, so this is about growth to get there. It doesn't have to be growth just through population, though. Industrial development, commercial development, that actually does a whole lot. That'll more to suck get there. up some of that, yeah. Right, and so that's a that's a big uh, bit of infrastructure that we can build on that a lot of other cities don't have. Secondly. Uh, if you begin to look at our public land portfolio, right, many people look at this again as another indicator of of, of a liability, right? right? You've got all this vacant land, and this, the the public entities own it all, and boy, this is not good. But at the end of the day, that really does give uh, the city and other folks a strategic advantage to to take land, to reassemble it, and actually to to utilize it for different means. We have to recognize, though, within the city of Detroit today, we do have an anemic economy. Right. And we do, you know, we need to think more innovatively, more innovatively about how we use that land. Yeah. Yeah. We're out of time. Uh, great to have you guys here. Wonderful work on the report. And as a Detroiter, I got to say, I'm really looking forward to seeing it unfold. As so. a Detroiter, too, I agree. That's right. <laughs> it's good news for all of us. Yeah.
I want to say thanks to my guests and thanks to you for joining us. We'd love to hear what's on your mind, so connect with us on Facebook and continue the conversation. I also want to take a moment to note a change here at ABJ. Jamie K. Walters, who has produced this show since I began hosting it three years ago, is moving on to a fabulous new opportunity at another station. Jamie's influence on the show and on me has been nothing short of foundational. She's the colleague I work most with on the show's look, feel, and content. And every week when I get here and sit in this chair, it's her tireless work that makes mine possible. We'll miss her and we wish her well. We'll see you next time on American Black Journal.